Howdy folks! This is a Lear 3, which is made by Shit Audio, yes, that is uh, their name. And this is a, a headphone amplifier slash preamplifier with an optional uh, USB DAC module. And it's a pretty nice um, piece of audio equipment. It's not super high-end and it's not entry-level either. Um, and I've had this for a couple of years now, so this is nothing new to me. And it has, uh, you know, a couple gripes as far as quality on the outside goes. Uh, some of the switches uh, don't line up properly, and some of the stuff on the back is kind of crooked. Um, but uh, the big problem that I have with this is I'm going to actually call it a design flaw. Um, it has, uh, obviously, it has a speaker protect circuit in it, just like any uh, piece of audio gear that's worth um, worthwhile, um, which is designed to prevent DC uh, from getting to the outputs to protect the speakers or, or headphones or whatever you plug into this. Um, this also has an integrated time delay, so when you turn the power on, it waits for the tube to warm up before it connects the output as well. Um, and uh, I, I suspect those are probably linked together. But the issue is, it's it's too sensitive. Um, and so the, the, uh, the speaker protect trips, um, therefore disconnecting the output, um, when I'm listening to normal audio. So I actually have, um, you know, professionally produced, officially released uh, music that you cannot play on this amplifier because, you know, whenever the chorus starts, it will trip out because of speaker protect. And so I, uh, and it also happens on uh, watching movies or videos. Um, a lot of times, like, you'll be watching a YouTube video and maybe they were outside and it was windy and the, you know, that low frequency content is actually enough to trip the uh, trip the speaker protect on this, which is very annoying. So I opened up Audacity and I, I basically dropped, I just generated a sine wave and I dropped the frequency and eight hertz is the lowest frequency that this will um, play without tripping. Uh, as soon as you go to seven hertz, it instantaneously trips. Um, so if there's any frequencies below seven hertz in your audio, uh, my unit will trip out. And so, um, I think that ideally it should be lower than that. Obviously, there has to be a cutoff at some point um, because, you know, at some point, low frequency AC looks like DC. So there is, a, there is a threshold, but I think 8 hertz is a little bit too high, in my opinion. Um, so I'd like to take this apart and see if I can modify this to um, sort of uh, re reduce that uh, threshold. Um, my best guess is this is probably using like an RC uh, filter um, to generate like a like a time delay th through like an RC time constant, um, which is probably going into some comparator or something. Um, and so if, if they're doing it in an analog fashion, which I suspect they are, um, then it should be relatively easy to modify those component values to adjust the performance. Um, so I am going to uh, uh, take this apart, show you how to take it apart, and uh, we will uh, see about modifying it. So to disassemble the Lear 3, the first thing to do obviously is to unplug it all and then we're going to remove the tube um, just to protect it and also because you do eventually have to take this out to get the top cover off. So uh, obviously just grab it and uh, rock it back and forth while you pull up on it. Um, that'll try, uh, that's the easiest way to uh, avoid breaking the glue between the plastic base and uh, the glass enclosure. Um, I'm not going to do it because I need to grab the base because my socket is quite tight and I need something to hold this thing down with. Um, but that's all you need to do to remove it. It's very easy. Anyone who's ever dealt with a valve before should um, know how to do this. And uh, then we can get uh, get on to removing the, uh, removing the top cover. And, uh, you know, but, but you don't even have to go much further. I can tell you that getting the cover off of this is the most difficult part of this entire thing, um, so you're gonna you're gonna be hit with the most difficult part of disassembly right away. So with the tube removed, the first step is to actually remove the volume knob. Now, if you turn the volume knob, you will find that there is a hole in it, and that has a grub screw in it. Now, it is a hex head grub screw. It's actually relatively deep, um, and it is going to be stupid tight. So, um, believe it or not, um, I would actually recommend. Uh, you know, if you try your hex head and it, it, it starts to strip, which it probably will, I recommend actually using a Torx bit um, because it gives a lot more purchase um, and it allowed me to get this off without completely stripping it out. 
Um, so yeah, you're, 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 you're going to hate yourself, um, trying to get this out, especially because of how deep it is. Um, so you, you know, you may actually have an issue if you're using a screwdriver like this, where it's just got these little bits, um, because it's going to come right up to, uh, where the, the, you know, the fat hex head or the fat hex shaft starts. Um, so you may have difficulty getting all the way into the fastener. Um, but, uh, it, because it's a grub screw, um, it's a standard size. So, you know, if, if you do strip it out, um, you can always get another grub, grub screw. So it's not a, a huge problem. Um, the other thing to note is that uh, the shaft of the pot that this is connected to is um, it's not keyed in any way. So uh, just make sure that uh, when you um, when you take it off, you note you know where the low volume position is. Um, obviously it, it, it does have an end stop, so you can always just center it, but if you, uh, you know, if you're super picky of where the volume starts and stops, um, just make note of that before you take the screw out. So now with the volume knob removed, um, you'll see that there is a nut um, on the shaft of the pot here with a little washer behind it. So uh, to get this off, I generally just uh, tend to use some needle nose pliers and uh, just grab and spin the nut off, it's a normal thread, and it will come off. So once you've removed the uh, washer and the nut from the shaft of the volume pot, um, your next task is to get the uh, the top aluminum uh, cover off of the bottom. So this is basically just two pieces. There's the top uh, aluminum cover, which covers the front and the top, and then the steel shell, which covers the rest of the sides. The only thing that is mechanically securing this top piece on was that nut we just removed, which means the rest is all friction. And uh, this is going to suck the first time you do it 100%. Um, basically, this top piece has to slide forwards towards the front of the unit, um, away from the bottom because there's um, some metal, um, they're not clips, but they're uh, little uh, little um, pins that are, are slotted into um, the top of the bottom frame. And the friction is pretty significant on those. Um, and so what I found myself having to do to actually get this open was to... Um, underneath here in this gap, which of course yours are going to start out a lot, a lot uh, thinner, um, I ended up having to insert a, you know, a prying tool um, and just press it down. Like we're talking, I can't even insert this and bend it because I would bend or snap this. That's how much force is involved. I just inserted it and just used the width of this and I just pushed it down on either side and I kept going and eventually um, I made enough of a gap that I was able to um, you know, slide the two apart from one another, which of course I won't be able to do that um, with one hand. Um, but trust me, it, it, this is how you have to do it. Um, don't press on the volume knob, so don't, don't try and do this. Um, that is not good. The, the volume knob, uh, that pot is not, you know, I, I, it's, a, it's an expensive pot. I would not uh, apply any mechanical force to it. Um, you need to grasp the, the sides and, uh, and do it that way. Um, so I will, uh, I will do that with two hands and then I'll come back to you. So now with the top cover off, um, you can now turn your attention to the uh, DAC module, which is this board here. Now you need to remove the two screws on the back that hold this blanking plate on because uh, the lower one is actually attached to the board itself. Now you can choose to leave the board in uh, and remove the whole thing um, with just these screws removed on the back, or you can take the board out at this stage, which is what uh, I'm going to do. Um, now, one thing that you'll probably notice, uh, if yours is anything like mine, is that your board is having a super bad time. Uh, it is very, very, very bent, um, because you can actually see this, this white line here where the board's supposed to be, and you can see how the board is curving in. It's The whole board is twisted this way, and the reason uh, is because uh, it doesn't fit. It straight up doesn't fit. This is not actually a manufacturing uh, defect. This is simply um, a design error that has been made in the mechanicals of this product. Uh, the board is physically too long to fit in this chassis with the blanking plate installed. That's also the reason why you can see the blanking plate is uh, kind of crooked um, with respect to the rest of the chassis. Uh, again, and you know, there's like a little gap down here. That's actually because the whole board is twisted in that way. So the bracket is actually straight with respect to the board. And if you actually, uh, if you take this blanking plate out, um, you'll be able to put the board in and it'll be nice and straight and everything will be good. But there's not enough 
of a, of a gap between the end of the PCB here and where the blanking plate is inside here. The blanking plate is thicker than it should be, and as a result, the only way to get this board in is to mangle the board like this, um, which is what they did from the factory. So um, you, you could shave the board down, but that's not really... That may help you, may not help you. I am not going to do that, but uh, I guess don't be alarmed. If it looks like this, that's the normal way to do it. Uh, from that they've chosen, I, I don't like it. But anyway, there's a screw down here which holds uh, this end of the board down, and then there's, of course, the header here. So remove these two screws, remove this screw, and then pull up on this, and then it comes out. Um, the plate will just fall off, and then we can proceed to removing the rest of the board. So once you have the top cover off and the... Uh, DAC board removed, then you can just remove all of the screws on the underside of the board, uh, which I've already done here. So all the screws on the bottom uh, you need to remove. Uh, there's nothing under any of the rubber feet, they're just actually, they go straight through. Um, so once you've removed all of those, you can then remove this board. Um, just be mindful that underneath uh, this area here, there is a thermal pad, um, and so you'll want to lift the board up um, from this side, from the open side, and then pull out. Um, and just, just be mindful, it might be a little sticky because of the thermal pad under here. Um, you'll also need to remove all of the screws on the rear, the ones for the two jacks, as well as the um, power connector. Uh, but this screw here, this large one, actually doesn't go to anything. It's just to plug a hole in the, uh, in the chassis. Um, this is, I believe, for uh, grounding, if, if that's if I got that correct. Not really sure what that's for, but you don't have to remove that, um, but it doesn't hurt if you do. Um, so that is the next step, and then we can remove the board from here, and I'm going to try and do this one-handed. It's a little difficult because this is a very, very heavy, um, very heavy transformer. So there you go. So you can see um, this is the thermal pad I was talking about. Um, so you can see all the power devices on this, uh, on the bottom side of the board are heat synced to this. So uh, try not to destroy this. It's, it's pretty thick and it's pretty well stuck down to this board uh, or to this uh, case. So it should come off on the board side. Um, and so it shouldn't move. So it should be easy to put back when, uh, when you're done. Another thing to note on the quality control here is you can see um, they've actually had to shave down, grind down this corner probably to get the top on. So that's an interesting, uh, you know, obviously their their uh, manufacturing process must not be uh, quite perfect on uh, on bending these cases. So this is what the board looks like in the Lear 3. Uh, we've got our two linear power transformers, our, uh, of course, our mains input. We've got a bridge rectifier package here. We've got our main um, smoothing capacitors as well as our power supply transistors down here. Lots more smoothing capacitors. Power switch, there's a little glass fuse which is replaceable. We have an Alps um, 100K audio times two pot here. Um, we've got our selecting selection switches for the gain and the input. Uh, we've got the quarter inch output jack, little LED with a light pipe on it. Uh, tube socket, which is a ceramic socket. We've got our input and our preamp output. Um, some audio uh, coupling capacitors. Uh, this is the header for the optional DAC module and then we've got the speaker protect and relay circuit here. And uh, the bottom is mostly empty with the exception of um, these uh, actual amplifier packages here. So these are the ones uh, that actually uh, do the uh, the current output. Um, and so you can see it's, it's, it's very, very nicely made. They've got, uh, you know, metal uh, threaded uh, standoffs that are soldered into the board. Um, it, it looks, it, I mean, it, it looks like it's designed very well. Um, obviously, it's very, very heavy, um, which is probably one of the reasons why the board is so thick, um, probably for signal integrity reasons as well, but um, these transformers are incredibly heavy. Um, that's why this thing is such a, such a hefty, uh, hefty uh, amplifier. But um, the, the, the quality is pretty good, but it's not perfect. Um, there are, are a few things that I noticed, um, you know, when I got my unit. Um, so, for example, this switch, you, you may or may not even be able to see it, but these switch, this switch on this side is a little bit uh, can't, sort of cantilevered upwards. Um, it's not actually flush with the board. Um, and so as a result, when this is in the up position, uh, the switch lever actually contacts the, uh, the, the top of the slit in the housing. The switch still works fine, but you notice that the switches don't line up when, when they're both in the same position. So, you know, there's a, a bit of a, you know, uh, manufacturing goof up there. Um, you know, little, little things like that, you know, probably I wouldn't care if this wasn't such a, you know, 
premium piece of equipment, but it is something that I consider to be um, uh, an, an issue. Uh, and also the, the other manufacturing sort of goofs were with the, the DAC module, so I haven't showed you that yet. This is the DAC module, and uh, there's, there's literally nothing on the back side. And uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's kind of what you'd expect. You know, you've got the USB input here. You've got your uh, USB audio um, controller here with its own oscillator and memory. You've got two separate um, DACs, and then you've got the, uh, the op-amp buffers on the output, and it just goes straight in through this header into that header on the board here. So, you know, everything's pretty straightforward. But uh, that's what's in here, but that's not really what we're interested in for this project. We're interested in the speaker protect circuitry over here, so I'll show you that in a little bit closer detail. So this is the speaker protect circuitry here. It's all nice and conveniently located in one place. We've got one relay with, of course, two gangs, which is going to um, switch both the headphone output and the RCA output because they are in parallel, so they only need one relay for that. And uh, this circuit provides uh, two distinct fun uh, pieces of functionality. One of them is a time delay uh, on startup, which is to give the vacuum tube time to heat up. And the second one is your standard, um, you know, speaker protect uh, functionality, which is to uh, basically prevent any uh, you know, significant amount of DC um, from getting uh, to the outputs. So uh, the circuit detects if there is a DC component um, on the output, it switches the relay off. Uh, and as a result, it protects the speakers connected, um, and that's that's basically the uh, the primary function of it. Uh, it also, because of the time delay feature and everything, it also um, re reduces any sort of uh, popping or um, you know noises like that during the amplifier startup, um, where things like these capacitors have to charge up, um, and there's you know a, a very very high output swing, low frequency output swing. Um, that stuff sort of gets. Um, removed because this relay is normally open. So the outputs actually have to be actively connected um, to the output of the amplifier um, by this relay. So I've gone through and I've reverse engineered this circuit and uh, I've drawn up a diagram which I'll show you in a moment. Um, but it is, uh, it's a relatively straightforward uh, implementation. Um, it took me two tries to actually get the reverse engineering right because um, some of the traces are um, very low impedance to ground, so I actually had some stuff connected in the wrong place, but I'm uh, pretty sure of the schematic that I've come up with. And uh, uh, it's pretty easy to understand. I'll, I'll break it down. And uh, the good thing is we can modify this to correct the problem um, very, very easily uh, with a single component uh, addition or change, depending on uh, how you want to do it. Um, so yeah, let me show you the schematic. So this is the speaker protect and time delay circuit in the Lear 3, and it's pretty straightforward, and uh, if you're not familiar with what you're looking at, I will go over it. So the easiest way to look at it is to ignore uh, all of this stuff right here, and this is effectively the time delay circuit. So um, I unfortunately only have two hands, so I'm not going to be able to cover this up, but just ignore all this stuff here. So this right here is the relay coil, and so like I said, this is... Um, this needs to be energized in order for the speaker, um, or in this case, the outputs to be connected to um, the the actual signal on from coming from the amplifier. So uh, on one side of the coil, we have our, our 24 volts. Um, we just have our, our regular flyback diode here to protect um, the rest of the circuit. And uh, we need a path to ground. So the path to ground is provided by this FET here. Um, this is an N-channel MOSFET. And uh, in order for this MOSFET to turn on, we need a, a, uh, the voltage on the gate to be uh, above the source by whatever its turn-on voltage is, which is about 2 volts uh, in, in my situation. And so um, this line needs to be uh, above, uh, above 2 volts. So we have uh, this capacitor here. This is a big electrolytic. Uh, it's 100 microfarads. And uh, it has a... Uh, just a 1 meg discharge resistor to slowly bleed it down um, when the device turns off. And uh, there's this one resistor, it's the only value actually I don't know. Uh, it's not measurable in circuit, um, so unfortunately I don't know what the value is. I'm not going to bother to desolder it to, to figure it out. But the, the idea of this is when, the, uh, when you first apply power, uh, this capacitor is discharged. And so when 24 volts appears here, um, this is at 0 volts, so the current will flow through this resistor uh, and charge this capacitor up. And uh, so since the capacitor is zero um, volts, the gate will be zero volts, this transistor will be off. And so the, uh, the time delay is provided by the RC time constant of this resistor and this capacitor. Um, and so you can 
increase or decrease the time delay by either increasing this capacitor size. Uh, so if you want to if you want to increase it, you can increase the capacitor size or increase the resistor, or to decrease it, you could decrease either of the values, and that would reduce the time delay. And so once this capacitor charges up to the point where it's above two volts, this transistor turns on, the coil energizes, and it remains energized um, until this capacitor uh, is discharged again uh, below this threshold value. So that's what provides the time delay. And that's, uh, that's pretty easy. Um, now we have the, uh, the actual speaker protect uh, portion. And it's based off of a single op amp. Um, this is one of the, uh, this is an OPO7C from TI. It has uh, two uh, extra inputs, um, which are for you know, fancy op amps. They're not actually connected to anything, so we can completely ignore them. Um, and we can also comple completely ignore the, the rails, because of course they're not important. So we, on the inputs here, um, the positive input is grounded. Um, on the negative input, we have the left and right channels. So the, the left and right audio signals are single-ended, so they're referenced to ground. Uh, and they've got two um, 100K uh, resistors um, to sort of couple the two together because this has to protect both the left and the right channels. Um, so in this case, they've decided to connect the left and right channels together uh, and use one op amp. Um, technically, this introduces crosstalk between the left and the right channels because there's a signal between the two. So if you were really snobby, um, you would, uh, you know, probably you would put a second op amp and you would basically duplicate this circuit for left and right. Um, but they've chosen for cost reasons to not do that in this uh, in this particular amplifier. Um, so we have, um, you know, assuming that let's say that both the channels are the same, you know, because of the parallel resistance, you could assume we have 50k um, on the the input resistance. Um, we have two back-to-back -back diodes here. Uh, this basically just clamps the voltage uh, between the, the positive and the negative of this um, to no more than the diode drop, which is probably 0.7 volts. Um, I didn't look up the, the particular diode part number. It's not really that important. It's just a simple clamp. Um, and then we have uh, the magic happens over here. So um, we have our uh, we have a, a one meg feedback resistor, um, and we also have a feedback capacitor, which is a, a 10 microfarad capacitor. So the capacitor in the feedback network um, allows, uh, basically, it operates this op amp uh, as an integrator. So um, the whole term operational amplifier, you know, comes from mathematical operations. You can, you know, you can integrate, differentiate, add, subtract, you can do math with an op amp. So in this case, uh, it's integrating the input signal uh, on the output. And this, this resistor is used to adjust the gain when the, uh, the amplifier or, uh, is... Um, seeing a low frequency signal because of course uh, at, at low frequencies the the capacitor is 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 just kind of be kind of kind of be open so uh, the thing's going to saturate um, and then uh, and I'll, I'll come back to this in just a moment uh, just to explain the rest of the circuitry we have a 10k uh, resistor in series with a 10 microfarad cap on the output um, which then goes to our uh, our capacitor here um, the two circuits are coupled into one and then we have these two PNP transistors, and uh, my diagram's not that great, um, but the emitters are both tied to the sides of the capacitor, and the bases are tied to the other sides uh, of the capacitor. So this emitter is tied to this side, which means its base is tied to this side. This emitter is tied to this side, which means its base is tied to this side, and the collectors are both tied to ground. So what this circuit does is, because these are PNP, um, you need a, a base emitter junction voltage uh, you know, above, let's say, 0.7 volts um, for these uh, to conduct to ground. So what these are effectively doing is if the voltage across this 10 microfarad capacitor exceeds um, that junction voltage, uh, either in the positive or negative direction, that's why there's two transistors, one handles the positive direction, the other one handles the negative direction, um, if the voltage across this capacitor exceeds that, that diode junction um, voltage, then... Uh, one of these two transistors will short um, to ground. And uh, the, the, the reasoning for this is, um, this is this is used to discharge this big capacitor here. So um, under normal operation, this capacitor will have a voltage on it, um, which is, of course, what's going to be um, you know, turning this transistor on and uh, keeping the coil energized. But if this circuit detects a DC, then these transistors will short this capacitor to ground, you know, basically instantly uh, removing all of the voltage from it, which sh shuts this transistor off, which opens the, the relay and protects the speakers. So that's what this network is doing. 
And so this is a uh, an integrator, and the idea here is that when the 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 input is um, a if, if the, the, te technically speaking, um, an AC signal is is classified as AC um, if its integral is zero. Um, if you have an AC signal and it integrates to a non-zero value, it's technically uh, a DC signal, um, or or in that case, an AC signal with or a DC a DC signal with AC superimposed on top of it. Um, right? You can have an AC signal that's changing, but if its integral is non-zero, that means that it, it has a DC offset. Um, and the DC offset is the part that this is designed to protect against. So um, having an integrator makes a lot of sense uh, because you, you want to be checking for that, uh, for that output. So um, ultimately, there, there's an RC time constant that's formed um, you know, between the input resistance uh, and, and this capacitance. But uh, simply put, the, the, the output of the op amp is going to swing um, positive or negative um, if there is a, a DC component on the input. And how quickly uh, it does that is going to be determined by the value of this capacitor and the value of the resistors. And so in, in, in my situation where the speaker protect is engaging at too high a frequency, um, I can uh, correct that or, or, or modify that behavior um, by changing the value of this capacitor right here uh, in the feedback network. Now, yes, you could change the other resistors, but um, that may change the behavior of the amplifier um, and, uh, you know, because they are technically connected to the signal and I don't really want to do that. Whereas changing this capacitor isn't really going to make any difference. Um, and so uh, this is the easiest thing to change. So if I increase the value of this capacitor, it will take longer for the output of the uh, the op amp to saturate uh, positive or negative when a DC um, signal or, or a low enough frequency AC signal um, is present um, because we're basically going to be increasing the time constant when this gets increased. So um, it, it, uh, it, it makes sense that, you know, if it's tripping at, at you know, 8 hertz, if I double this, um, you know, that should be perfectly good to, to drop the, 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 you know, the low bound frequency uh, down enough that, you know, my problem should go away. So uh, a 22 microfarad cap would make a lot of sense. Um, I couldn't find any 22 mic caps in my stash of uh, uh, SMD components, but I did find some um, some 10, 10 mic caps, so basically the exact same thing as what's in here. So I'm just going to parallel another 10 mic cap. I'm just going to stack it on top of here. So this is the, the circuit, and uh, just to point out where some stuff uh, is, um, so obviously we have our uh, our relay here. We've got our uh, flyback diode. This is that MOSFET that turns the uh, that turns this on and off. Um, we have our bleed resistor on top here. This is that resistor that actually affects the time constant with this big cap. This is the cap that the gate of that MOSFET is connected to. And then on this side, we've got our op amp here. These are our two 100k resistors for the left and right that come into the input. These are our clamping diodes across the uh, the two inputs. And then on the output. Um, we have this resistor uh, and this capacitor. These are the, um, this is the actual feedback network. So this capacitor right here is the one that we are interested in. And uh, its value is C25 or its designator C25. So that's the one we want to we wanna deal with. Um, and this is that 10K and this is the other 10 mic cap. And these are those two PNP transistors that are across this one. Uh, and their collectors uh, are tied to ground. So this value, this cap here, is what we want to uh, we want to change, and so I'm just going to put another capacitor directly on top of it to double its uh, its value from 10 mic to 20 uh, mic, and uh, it's a 25 volt cap which I have. Um, this op amp seems to saturate to about 15 volts, um, so that should be perfectly uh, happy with that voltage. Um, this cap is rated at 35 volts, so it you know I, I think it's definitely uh, safe to do that, and so that should uh, correct my issue. And uh, it won't affect the startup time delay because that's set by this resistor there. So um, it's only going to affect the uh, the DC part. And um, I think it's perfectly safe to do this because realistically, tripping at eight hertz is a little bit uh, too high. Um, you know, speakers can tolerate DC, um, you know, to a uh, to an extent. I mean, uh, 
I would consider 4 hertz to not be low enough frequency to damage any speakers, especially nothing that's really plugged, going to be plugged into this. Um, so, uh, you know, if there's really a problem, you know, the, the power amplifiers and stuff that, that could take the output of this, um, they're the ones that will have their speaker protect trip, not this. So uh, this is really just not, uh, uh, not a concern for me. So I'm going to go tack that on, and uh, we'll go test this out. So while I'm in here and I'm soldering that capacitor on, I also want to turn my attention to the output buffer amplifiers for these uh, two DACs. And uh, these are TI OPA 1662s. And uh, if you look up their specs, uh, they're, they're, they're pretty good uh, as far as uh, you know, an off-amp goes. Um, but I, I have this history of sort of modifying the, uh, the buffers in uh, sort of uh, just general audio gear. I've changed the ones in my current uh, other sound card that I have, which is uh, an Asus Zonar SNS STX. And uh, if you watched my video of the repair of that Theo headphone amp, I also changed uh, the ones in there as well. And so I thought, well, I might as well just go for it while I'm in here because, uh, you know, I like to experiment and see how things sound. Now, uh, as I mentioned in that video, my favorite op amp of choice um, has been this one, uh, which is the LME uh, 4970, um, uh, 49... 720, sorry. Um, and these are, uh, they're relatively expensive for an op amp. They're, they're a little over $4 Canadian each. Um, but they have very, very good um, specifications, uh, much better than uh, the ones that are on there. And uh, I've noted that these have a very good, very wide sound stage compared to a lot of other uh, uh, op amps. And so I like the way that they sound. And uh, they still make these. They don't make them in the fancy TO-99 package anymore. Uh, but, of course, they're still produced in, you know, all the normal plastic packages. So you can get it in the SOIC and the DIP, and it should fit in pretty much, you know, it's got the standard pinout. It fits pretty much ev every dual op-amp. Um, but while I was on DigiKey, I thought I would take a look to see, um, you know, is there actually anything better than these? Because, you know, I don't, I don't even remember how I got to picking these originally. Uh, it's been so many years. Um, like, r really, it's been, you know, seven or eight years since I, I started using these and stuff. And so I found, I went through a lot of op amps, and I found um, a bunch that were better, but they were kind of outrageous. And I ended up settling on uh, these. So these are also from TI. Uh, these are OPA 1612Q1, and these are about $12 uh, Canadian each. So, uh, you know, they're three times as expensive as that. So obviously, if you, uh, you know, <laughs> if you want to go the, the less expensive route, I still recommend those. But these have uh, better specifications in, in basically every single regard. Um, but, of course, the differences are very, very minute uh, in the grand scheme of things. So yes, this has, for example, half the distortion and noise as that, but we're talking about, um, you know, point quad oh three percent to point quad one five percent. And like the, for example, the voltage noise, um, that one is 2.7 nanovolts per root hertz at 1K, and this is 1.1 nanovolt per root hertz at 1K. And I think this one is like five or nine or something like that. You want the lower number for that value. So um, this one also has a, a much, much faster um, settling time than, than that does. So uh, I'm going to try these out and just see what happens. And, uh, you know, I wish that there were sockets here. And that would be really, really nice that I could just you know, swap them at will. Uh, but, you know, this is, uh, this is a random thing. It's not related to the repair, but just want to let you know I'm, I'm doing this because uh, this, I find this kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, I'll uh, throw those in as well as the cap, and uh, we'll put it back together. So I've made the modification, and uh, hopefully you can see there, I don't know how close my camera will go, but that's the uh, two capacitors stacked on top of each other there, um, and uh, that will increase the capacitance. And uh, I've also, um, I also fixed my switch as well, so they're now both nice and straight. Um, so that, that was actually pretty easy to do. And I've also changed uh, the two op amps for the, uh, the new ones. Uh, these are the OPA 1612s, so we'll see how these go. And uh, yeah, there's still a little bit of flex residue. I don't have an ultrasonic cleaner or anything, so this will have to do. So I'm going to put this back together, and we're going to uh, see how it operates. So I've got it back in place, um, all put back together. And of course, I can turn it on. And uh, from the testing that I've done, um, it definitely uh, makes a difference. Obviously, um, 
I think realistically I could have gone with a much smaller capacitor, um, probably you know no more than a, a one microfarad or a 2.2 at, at most um, would have achieved the, uh, the desired effect. Um, putting a 10 microfarad in parallel, um, you know, doubling the capacitance was entirely unnecessary, and uh, it, it drops the uh, it drops the frequency way, 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 way down to uh, sub one hertz. Um, so if you know if I was to do this again, uh, I would recommend a much smaller capacitor. You know, like I, like I said, like a microfarad or or two at most, um, and, and that will achieve the uh, the desired effect. Um, now, normally I would fix this, and you know, in the future I might. Uh, if I decide to, you know, change those op amps again or something, um, I will totally, you know, do that. But knowing how much of a pain it is to get this thing apart, um, I'm going to leave it the way it is for right now. And, um, you know, it still has, uh, it's, it still works. Um, you know, I, I can play the music that I wasn't able to play through it before. Um, and it, it does take a little bit longer um, to, yeah, you just heard the speaker protect. So it, I, I think it, it does take a little tiny bit longer um, to start up uh, after... Um, you know, cold power on, uh, but you know you're going to have to wait a minute anyway. So I don't really think it's a it's a big deal, um, and especially if you use a smaller capacitor, the the effect on that would be pretty much negligible. So I haven't had enough listening experience to say whether those op amps I put in um, uh, are are you know worth it or not. I have to listen to a whole bunch of different music and, and figure it out um, for myself. But that's besides the point. Um, the uh, the modification was successful. Um, so, you know, if you want to, uh, if you, if you're experiencing this problem, um, with, you know, windy YouTube videos and things like that cutting out, um, this is absolutely uh, a modification that you can do. Um, and as long as you can get the case off, it's actually super easy. So, um, that was it. Hopefully, uh, you found something interesting and, uh, as always, thanks for watching.